It was billed as one of the greatest comebacks the sporting world had ever seen. But for the team on the wrong side of victory, the humiliating defeat at the 2013 America's Cup was almost the end of the road. 8-1, up, who the hell, how the hell can you lose the America's Cup at 8-1? Four years later, reborn, energized and victorious in Bermuda, Emirates Team New Zealand were back after a dominant display saw them finally exercise the ghosts of San Francisco 2013. This month on Mainsail, we're in Auckland, New Zealand to look inside the team that turned a famous defeat into a remarkable victory. And to ask what's next for the oldest trophy in world sport. This month on Mainsail, we return to New Zealand to tell a very different story. After 2013's bitter defeat, Emirates Team New Zealand's win last year was even more special, and the entire nation was behind them as they returned home. The celebrations were extensive. Sailors, designers, management, all lauded as heroes. But the nationwide ecstasy at the end of the campaign was about an awful lot more than just that win in Bermuda. Four years previously at the 2013 America's Cup in San Francisco, things didn't quite go to plan for Team New Zealand. So the Kiwis are now on the precipice of taking away the America's Cup from Oracle Team USA. Emirates Team New Zealand looked unstoppable. They coasted to victory after victory over the Americans. Emirates Team New Zealand, the Kiwis now just one win away from the America's Cup. Just one more win needed, an entire nation was already celebrating. But that final win never came. Team New Zealand lost eight straight races as the world witnessed one of the greatest turnarounds in sport by Oracle Team USA. These guys have nine lives, no wonder they're sailing a cat. The comeback of 2013 is complete. America's Cup will stay in America. For the nation, it was a sporting catastrophe. That was a pretty devastating time, obviously, and it made us relook at everything, at ourselves and how we'd done it and, and how did we get to that situation where we'd been that far in front and, and not win. At the forefront of the campaign, the man in charge, Grant Dalton, had been running things at Team New Zealand for several cup campaigns and was very much seen as accountable for the loss. You do feel responsible because they're your fan base and they believed, and we believed, I mean, 8-1 up, Who the hell, how the hell can you lose the America's Cup at 8-1? It was the aftermath that went on for at least a year, probably more, where it just did not stop. It was just a relentless attack of the media. We kept getting ripped from the outside. Um, everywhere you went, everybody you talked to, every time you picked up a newspaper. Twice before in its long history, the America's Cup has been won by a team from New Zealand. To the country, it's a trophy of vast significance. Missing out on winning it in 2013 was a bitter blow. Team New Zealand were very close to shutting up shop. Uh, their relationship with the government at the time was not good and getting funding from elsewhere was a serious, serious challenge. Grant Dalton faced a lot of challenges and hurdles, uh, just from funding, keeping a team together, trying to get the public support and goodwill across New Zealand, and that was easier said than done. After that defeat, the team was in turmoil. The public reaction was unforgiving. The burden of loss even saw Dalton temporarily move to the UK. The expectation of the sporting public and the media in New Zealand can be relentless, a fact well known amongst the nation's sporting leaders. There's a massive expectation on rugby and rowing, if you like, and yachting. And that expectation is superb for those teams because there's no hiding, you know, you know the expectation. If you didn't have that expectation, I don't think we'd do nearly as well. 
Four years after suffering a humiliating World Cup exit at the hands of France, Graham Henry led his All Blacks into a home World Cup. Having built on the lessons of the past and 24 years without World Cup success, his team eventually delivered. We learned that we needed to improve our mental skills to handle pressure, and that was a major focus going into 2.11 and on to 2.15 and so on. And so there has been a huge improvement in our ability to handle pressure. You never stop learning and you're always thinking, how can we do that better, you know? So the, the better never stop strategy, I'm sure is the same for the America's Cup boys as it is for the All Black boys. The All Blacks went on to win another World Cup in 2015. The New Zealand public, well, they were getting used to success. And as Bermuda approached, the pressure on Grant Dalton and his team was growing. In part two, we'll see how they dealt with the mounting expectation. But before then, here's a quick look at what else has been going on in the sailing world this month. Team Axo Nobel have won leg six of the Volvo Ocean Race from Hong Kong to Auckland. The Dutch team held off a charging fleet to claim the victory after a dramatic final 24 hours. They were just two minutes ahead of Team Scallywag. Matt Frey claimed third place with a huge effort on the final day that maintained their overall lead. Giovanni Soldini and the crew on board the trimaran Maserati have broken the record from Hong Kong to London. They set a new unofficial time of 36 days, 2 hours, 37 minutes and 2 seconds. And American Maxi Yacht Rambler 88 has won the Caribbean 600 trophy in Antigua, beating the record by nearly 3 hours. This month on Mainsail, we're in Auckland, taking an inside look at how Emirates Team New Zealand masterminded last year's stunning America's Cup win out on the waters of Bermuda's Great Sound. We've already seen how the team had to rebuild and start again if they had any hope of success at the next edition of the Cup. It was a daunting prospect, not least because the boats to be raced at the America's Cup in Bermuda would be the fastest, most technically advanced race boats ever built. Powered by wings, flying on retractable foils at speeds approaching 50 miles an hour. It was a design project that would see most of the six teams spend tens of millions of dollars. Let's get it down, get it over here. We knew that if we went the same way, we tried to m match them bullet for bullet, they were going to beat us every single time because they just outspent us three to one. Battling against the big budgets, much of the innovation, the enterprise of design and development is attributed to their skipper, Glenn Ashby. Glenn was always saying the boat we've got to be designing now, we've got to imagine where it's going to get to, but, but leapfrog those campaign cycles and get to Bermuda in, in a boat which will be the future. We had to really be pretty experimental and not hold back on innovation. You know, we had this kind of philosophy that we thought there's no point in us actually following what everyone else is doing because they've been doing it longer, there's more of them and they're more resourced than we are at the moment. So we might as well be confident in our direction choose our design direction and follow it. On launching their final race boat at home in Auckland in March 2017, the team finally revealed the much talked about cyclores, pedal driven power generators that supply hydraulic power to the catamaran's control systems, a move that stunned the sailing world. In a way it was a no-brainer for us. You get more power out of legs and arms. We needed a lot of power and we wanted guys free to use their hands. So, yeah, it was a bit of a gamble because it was out of unknown territory, but we decided we needed to push hard, so that's the way we went. With a design team trying to maximise speed and manoeuvrability, the new breed of cut boat would need a new breed of sailor. For Team New Zealand, that choice was obvious. Back in 2013 in San Francisco, at the same time Team New Zealand suffered that defeat, Pete Burling won the Youth America's Cup and was widely seen as one of the freshest young talents in the world of foiling. You needed a guy who was 
you know, athletic. He could anticipate, he could make calls by himself. It was calm, all those things. And, and Pete really fits that role. We never even discussed it as an issue that he'd never been in the America's Cup before. And he just seemed right at the time for that role. I was really lucky that, you know, you've been through the Olympic environment, seen a lot of pressure. And, you know, also in the previous games, you know, we went through with Blair as favourites and, you know, with a New Zealand team captains going to that, you know, we carried the New Zealand flag into the opening ceremony. We've done a lot of stuff and then still managed to perform afterwards. And I think that was something that, um, you know, definitely gave me a lot of confidence. With Berling came his longtime Olympic teammate, Blair Took, who, along with Cup veteran Glenn Ashby, made a formidable sailing team. Who ended up on the boat was a lot of young guys, a lot of us who had sailed together, grown up together, good mates from years ago, and then got four young kids here. And, uh, you know, the whole country's uh, hoping we can bring this thing back. So that was, that was pretty awesome. While Team New Zealand developed their boat in Auckland, one by one, the five other cup teams were setting up in Bermuda. To turn up there too early meant we'd be basically be like sailing here in the winter. And we'd seen through the previous couple of years watching the teams that they were blowing out day after day after day. We just stayed as long as we could. In Bermuda, the other teams were staging practice races. They even got together to sign a continuation contract for plans post the cup. On the outside, Team New Zealand were very much alone, described in one quarter as the most ostracised team in cup history. I could not abide by something which was just obviously jobs for, for boys. Um, and I don't feel any differently to this day. I felt personally that we didn't want to be part of the mates club. The fact that we managed to keep the, the cycling under wraps when 70 people in the team knew about it proves how, how close a group we were. Once in Bermuda, the team kept their preparations under wraps, careful not to show their hand before the campaign got underway. We weren't at our fastest until 24 hours, exactly 26 hours actually, before the first race of the America's Cup when we brought all our weaponry to bear. We, we, we gambled that we'd be just fast enough to get through. We brought it all on really late, but we tested it all in New Zealand before. Our learning curve was steep through those early rounds. Astounded me, like, you know, you could measure it daily almost. I used to sit up the front of our big chase boat with Kevin Shoebridge and he'd basically try and keep me calm. I was massively stressed, just all the way sort of through the campaign and just Increasingly so. With those boats, and they're, they're so on the edge from a mechanical point of view, anything could fail at any time. The team were looking good. Throughout the opening rounds of sailing, they won all but two of their opening matches. Through to the semi finals of the Challenger Series against Land Rover BAR, the team were looking fast until one mistake jeopardised the entire campaign. This month, mainsail sees us in Auckland, New Zealand, looking at how the team from this sailing mad nation reversed the humiliating America's Cup loss of 2013 and engineered an emphatic victory four years later. After a string of convincing race wins, Team New Zealand picked an off-the-pace-looking British team as their opponents in the semi-finals of the Challenger Series. And they looked confident. But for Grant Dalton and his boys, it was almost the end of the campaign. Kiwis, oh, they're taking a terrible nosedive. Oh, my goodness me. Men overboard, crisis time for New Zealand. I just see the bows go down pretty fast, and the next thing I was into like a Ford somersault into the water, so it all happened very fast. Pretty scary. I'm probably the highest up, and then you know, I somehow managed to get one hand in the tramp. I get fully flicked out of my cockpit, just managed to hold on with one hand, and then kind of managed to climb back in. The biggest relief was seeing, uh, you know, three helmets out the back of the boat, all above water, you know, all seemingly happy enough. Um, so we kind of knew that the main thing was that everyone was all right, and then uh, it kind of went into you know, a bit of recovery mode after that. The team limped home, their boat in tatters. 
delicate electronics and systems destroyed and just 24 hours to sort out the mess. It was a blow and I think it was only through the sort of sheer determination of everyone in the team to not only get the boat back on the water but to keep that belief alive that it wasn't enough just to go sailing. We had to go sailing and be as close as possible to the boat as it was the moments before the capsize. After the tragedy of the loss the prior time when the America's Cup was fought, you can imagine in New Zealand everyone sitting on the side of the edge of their seats and then bang, the boat flips. Everyone, I think, was just gut-wrenching. I don't think people really got the significance of how serious that capsize was and how serious it could have been, either with human injury or the damage to the boat. I remember 2.30 in the morning, wandering through the yard, every single person was in the yard working. And I went, wow, this is something special we created here. If you're trying to find a moment, that was probably the moment we won the America's Cup. We weren't going to lose it after that. Too much wind the following day and racing was cancelled. The team's 24 hours turned into 48 and things were looking up. It was one of those situations where, as I say, you know, in San Francisco, if it could go wrong, it was a 50-50 call and it could go wrong, it went the wrong way. In, in Bermuda, if it's a 50-50 call to go the right way, it went the right way and it happened a lot. And that was one of those cases. Fortunately for Team New Zealand post cap size, racing was going well. The team dispatched Ben Ainsley's British entry and then the Swedes team Artemis Racing to make it through to the cup itself against defenders Oracle Team USA. The campaign was back on track. So he's pulled the trigger. Has he gone too soon? Having battled to this point, Emirates Team New Zealand now looked unstoppable. New Zealanders have made a storming start to the America's Cup match. Exploding out of the blocks. The first weekend of racing saw them take four straight wins over defenders Oracle Team USA. Out in front, looking to claim their place in history. Memories of defeat four years previously could not detract from what became an emphatic victory. The team lost just one race. The cup was coming back to New Zealand. Well, relief that you didn't lose, that's the first thing. Redemption of what happened in San Francisco and pride as, as Kiwis and very much a Kiwi team uh, that could finally bring the America's Cup back. It was emotional, you know, like it was incredible when you just stand there with the people that you've worked with so closely for so long. And I just look at them and I think they were so deserving of being standing there. It was, it was a great moment. Yeah, help bring the cup back is you know, something that, um, you know, I think it will give us some pretty special memories for a long time. The America's Cup to Emirates Team New Zealand! Four years of relentless hard work and effort and the ghosts of San Francisco for Team New Zealand were finally laid to rest. But returning home for Dalton and his administration team meant the start of a fresh and daunting new challenge to be the host of the next America's Cup. America's Cup, you go, ah, it's great, New Zealand won. God, New Zealand won. You know, if you're there, now what do we do? As the new defenders, the team's role is now very different. The responsibility of running a viable competition for the next America's Cup lies in their hands. It's a massive undertaking and the workload has already begun. The initial project involves attracting new teams, finalising the venue and signing off on the new class of boat. We've decided to go with a monohull basically push the concept of a monohull as far as we can. You know, we, we don't want to throw away foiling. Foiling's cool, everyone loves it. But we want to see what, how we can bring that to monohull. So it's, it's really exciting for the design team and, and the sailors to have a completely new type of boat to sail. We want innovation, but innovation that relates to someone that might own a boat. And so therefore we went to monohull because there's no doubt the cats are cool. Basically Bermuda was a lake. Haraki Gulf is not a lake. So you were sort of forced to either a very um, clunky-ish uh, multi-hull that was basically wasn't going to tip over, or a monohull that had the same performance characteristics as a multi-hull. 
the boats are going to be ballasted, so they'll be heavier than, than the multi-hull. Um, and you won't be foiling in, in all wind conditions. So there's a really important transition of if we can actually get up out of the water. And that brings hull design back into the America's Cup, which is really exciting. Having won the Cup, hosting the next edition has always been the right of the Defender. It's an expensive project, but it's also an event that can carry significant benefits. The last time New Zealand hosted the Cup, this part of Auckland was transformed and is now the vibrant, bustling viaduct area of the city. But that was over 20 years ago. Now a new area of development must be found, and that's not a simple process. The current proposal would see harbour areas of the viaduct and parts of neighbouring Wynyard Point redeveloped to house America's Cup teams, villages and media. But it's a plan that requires significant buy-in from both the national government and city council. Finding something that the government as a partner finds acceptable, that the city can do and can benefit the city and that meets the needs of Team New Zealand. So three partners in this trying to find a, a balance to meet everybody's needs. It is by no means a done deal. Dalton has already stated if a suitable arrangement cannot be reached with Auckland, the Cup will be held at the home of their official challenger, 11,000 miles away in Italy. But hosting the event in New Zealand is very much the goal for Dalton and his team. It's huge for this country because this country understands the America's Cup. The public understand what will happen in the summer of 20 and 21, they'll know how big it will be. There's something about national pride and people coming together around a sporting event that makes people feel good and makes them proud of their country and that has intangible benefits that are very, very hard to value. It'll just be a great spectacle, the boats will be fast, amazing. It's just going to be bigger and better and amazing.